We're live. Okay, we on. are live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Beyer from not Chicago, but somewhere in France. Somehow, oh, somewhere in France. It sounds like a Dateline for a, you know. <laughs> secret well, I don't want to have to try to pronounce on successfully. No, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, I'm in. Uh, yeah, Ren. I'm in Brittany. Sure. That's the important. I'm in Brittany, yeah, right. France, and I'm I'm drinking red wine out of a coffee cup. It's tough right. times here at the Mercure Hotel. <laughs> at the Mercure Hotel <laughs> in uh, in Ren. Yeah, well, welcome the everybody to Hello. History Happy Hour, and we're delighted that you're here. And uh, we want to thank you all for joining us, uh, and especially our our Patreon supporters. And Chris, I didn't give you a warning here. Would you be ready to do Patreon supporters? Uh, I wouldn't. I, yeah, that's all right. I just want we'll, to thank them all. Well, thank them all today. And there's too yeah. many to thank by name if we thank them all. But we do have some great people supporting us by Patreon. And uh, we appreciate their help in keeping the history taps open. And we got a bunch of people here already, Chris. They're just oh, yeah. pouring in to see uh, Joe Belkowski today. Absolutely. We've uh, got Ken, Ken from Kansas. Uh, Mike from Normandy. Um Wow, they're Robert Fry from St. Louis, Frank Cook Mike from Mass. Mike Van Dobelstein is here. Mike, hoping to see you in a couple of days in Normandy. And, and, and Kate uh, is watching with her cat. And what's your we, cat's name, Kate? Yeah, and Ted Moon. What, Ted, what's the problem? Isn't there a football game on? Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, there are 60,000 NFL fans that descended on London today, and they were screwed up all the tubes, and everybody was wearing a Dolphins shirt, so I thought of Ted. Uh, that's uh, that's undoubtedly why he's able to watch the show. Is the football game was probably on at some ridiculous time <laughs> probably, in the United States. Probably. Yeah. Uh, uh, and here we have Xavier from Spain. So so I'm closer to you, Xavier, than I have been in at, for 78 other shows. And I'm closer mm -hmm. to you, Chris. Uh, I know. I can feel it. I know. Right across the right across the, the la tranche, as we la say tranche. in France. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you are an honorary Frenchman now, so I am. I am. Let's we're not, we're not going to go too deeply into that. But, okay. Uh, um, uh, do you, okay. Do you think that we have now I wasted enough of Joe's precious time that we I can, think we we can start the the show? Okay. Yes. Here we go. Bing. Oh, again? Well, that's the same trip. That's true, it they is. They don't All have right. the bell. Yeah. Well, the bar is open. The, anyway. The bar, the bar is open. And I want to apologize if I'm a little fuzzy. It's probably the wine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, or else it's the low speed of my internet connection here. But uh, listen, the reason that I'm in France uh, is that we did, Chris, we did a dedication yesterday. Uh, right. The first Ghost Army historical marker in France. And it's in the town of Plebenec, which is outside of Brest, and it commemorates Operation Brest. And we had a really amazing ceremony yesterday. About 250 people were there for the dedication nice. ceremony. And uh, I, I made a little video, and it's specially designed as uh, Chris Anderson friendly. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Because it has bagpiping in it. Yay, see? Let's just see, give let's you see, a little. A little taste of yesterday's uh, ceremony, Ghost Army uh, historical marker dedication. <laughs> Nice bow tie, by the way. Oh, thank you. And I, um, you know, I just want to say it was uh, it was very emotional, and it was especially emotional to me to think about the the guys who aren't yep. here anymore and who I came to know, and I started thinking about um, what they would have made of this and how they would have, you know, uh, responded to that, and that was a, a hard 
hard for me to get through without shedding a few tears uh, on their sure. behalf. And so I'm, I'm grateful to all the people uh, in France and America who made that happen. And uh, there's lots more about it that's going to be on the Ghost Army Facebook page. And oh, we're going to be on French television tomorrow. And so uh -huh. there's, uh, you should there's be proud of yourself. Of stuff. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm real pleased. I'm real pleased about that. Yeah. And, and uh, we have a little Ghost Army treat at the end. So we can toast that, right? So that's it. Oh, yeah. Can we? Army. Yeah, that's a whole lot of Ghost Army. Ghost. That's, you should have bought more than a half a bottle. Okay, yeah. I got the half bottle. That's all I've got. So mm. it's either that or the Pellegrino full of tap water, um, Pellegrino bottle full of tap water. But since I'm here in Brittany, uh, uh, oh, yeah. and we were, I was in Brest this morning. Uh, it was a great time for us to talk about some little-known fighting that took place yeah, in this area. Yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah, very excited about this. Um, I, those of you who uh, have watched the show know that um, Joe Balkowski, who is kind of the man when it comes to uh, the history of the U.S. soldier, particularly uh, in Normandy, um, also in uh, Brittany. Uh, he's joined us on a couple of other shows, but he has this, uh, agreed to join us today uh, to talk about his book about the 29th Division um, in Brittany. And we've promised him we're going to focus just on the fighting in Brittany. So we have a rare opportunity to, um, to focus in on this. Yeah, and that book is... Uh, I, I was waiting uh, for you to put it up. Yeah, Beachhead okay. to Brittany. I was waiting for you to say it. Oh, well, <laughs> from Beachhead to Brittany, and it's it's the next in kind of the, the series on the history of the 29th Division uh, in World War II, and we're going to say this a lot throughout the show, but they are all stellar, so you have to read them all. And, yeah, and, and Joe, we only have a moment or two left now. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm moving on. Sorry. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> so, you are, you, you, know, yeah. you, you are setting a record, you know. You are the first and only three-time guest yeah. on, on History Happy Hour. We're going to have to get you a coffee mug or something. I don't your know. present is undoubtedly in the mail. I'm sure Chris has taken care of it already. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's an I ashtray from the hotel. Happy. <laughs> I won't be happy until it's 10, so yeah, All right. let's get to work. Ooh, All right, right. we're ready. <laughs> okay, so um, Rick, do you have a picture that I'd, I'd like to start with? So this photograph, I'm sure everybody is familiar with. It's one of the most famous photographs of the war, and it shows soldiers of the 28th Division marching down the Champs-Élysées. Um, has to be one of the biggest victory parades Paris has ever seen. The city had been liberated a week before, and everybody knows it. So um, what they don't know about, I think, is the picture that I want to show you next. On the very same day that um, 28th Division is marching down the Champs-Élysées to celebrate uh, the liberation of the city, um, Sergeant Ralph Snyder uh, from the 115th Infantry, he was originally from Pennsylvania, is uh, walking into a field with his unit, uh, when they are opened up on by an MG42 machine gun, 10 of his men are instantly cut down. Um, Sergeant Snyder is miraculously survives the, the, the fuselage, um, kind of gets out of cover, strips off his combat harness, uh, puts on um, some Red Cross insignia, and tries to go out into the field to help his buddies. Uh, and he's killed uh, pretty quickly. Um, the unit is pinned down and under fire, and it is so bad that a George Clayton, who's wounded in the field that Snyder is in, um, kills himself to prevent any of his friends from coming to his rescue. And so, um, when you think about that, what I, I the first thing I ha question I have, Joe, is it, it, that happens outside the village of Bohars. That's 375 miles west of Paris. I, I thought we liberated Paris. I thought, I thought, what are they doing there? <laughs> What's going on? Well, that's the $64,000 question. I mean, um, everything that happens in Brittany in August and September of 1944 is really related to logistics and how uh, Eisenhower expected to manage uh, the great victory that had just happened in Normandy. But, you know, that was just step one. Operation Overlord, which was not just uh, a plan to uh, uh, break into the continent, it was a plan to destroy the German army and move into Germany. Well, uh, the, as I said, the victory in Normandy was only step one. The, the, the second step was to liberate uh, France and the Low Countries and advance 
into Western Germany across the Rhine and, and uh, complete the coup de main. And uh, what happens in Brittany is directly related to the immense challenge that is involved in supplying what by early September, actually late August, was already two million Allied soldiers on the continent. And, you know, it doesn't take a military genius to figure out that you're not going to defeat the German army unless you can feed, uh, clothe, and arm and uh, all those two million men. And they were going to grow to three million eventually. So, so Brittany was an absolute pillar of the original overlord plan that well before D-Day, it was understood that Normandy, although it had advantages in terms of fooling the Germans about where we were coming ashore, had disadvantages. It didn't have a super major port, with the possible exception of Cherbourg, although Cherbourg was not as significant as what Brest uh, was at that time. And secondly, you know, uh, the Mulberry Harbors, uh, the American and the British Mulberry Harbors were untested concepts. And as we know, the American one failed pretty utterly. And uh, the expectation of being able to supply millions of people by bringing in supplies over the beaches was a massive challenge. So I, to get to the point, <clears throat> Brest is really one of France's number one, number two harbor. Uh, if you've ever seen it, it's it's massive. You could put the entire U.S. Navy in there with the Royal Navy combined in World War II. And of course, it had enormous significance to the American Army because Brest was the main entry point of the American Army in World War I. So much so that uh, there was a monument put up to the U.S. Navy in Brest in the interwar period that incidentally was destroyed by the Germans during the, during the occupation. But Brest was, uh, you know, not only a massive in, uh, point of influx potentially for supplies, but it was also the fundamentally uh, most logical uh, entry point for men and equipment direct from the United States. Mm -hmm. So in the after, you know, uh, uh, get to the point here, in the aftermath of the Normandy invasion, Brest was the number one pillar of the overlord plan. I mean, it was expected to be in Allied hands by August 1st, 1944, and obviously it was not. So, Joe, you take as long to get to the point as you want to. Okay. We're, we're, okay. we're okay with that. Well, we got a lot of points to make. We got a lot of points to make. I know. And, and look, uh, it, it's probably uh, a good idea for us to do a, a little bit of recap, not so much of what's happened to the 29th in Normandy, but, but, but kind of who the 29th is, because this is a division that... You know, people. Uh, if you if you make a list of famous divisions, it's, it usually starts with the Airborne and the 101st and the uh, 82nd. And I'm not sure that the the 29th Division is uh, is a top of mind for people. But this is the division that uh, was first. The first uh, regiment from this division landed on Omaha Beach, and and this uh, division went through tremendous losses in Normandy before they ever get to Brest. And it's also a division that amasses in World War II, one of the kind of most amazing combat records of, of any division. So we're not just talking about another one of, you know, uh, 80 plus divisions that are in Europe. This is a pretty special one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I happen to have the good fortune to live in the town where it was raised in part. Uh, you know, even going back before D-Day, it was the third American division to make it to Britain. Uh, in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor for a, a significant period of time. It was the only American division in Britain because the, uh, the those that came ahead were pulled out for Operation Forge in North mm -hmm. Africa. Um, it was, uh, it had, it had a significantly longer period of amphibious training than almost any other division in the army. And that is obviously why it was selected to land in the first wave on Omaha Beach in conjunction with the first division. But on the tragic side, of course, it, uh, 
it amassed more casualties than any division in the Army, save two, I believe, in World War II. And I believe those two divisions had been engaged in combat in the Mediterranean before yeah. Yeah. D-Day. So if you're counting only June 44 to May 45, the 29th Division leaves the pack. And, uh, you know, as I discuss in my books, uh, that could either be ascribed to being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or perhaps uh, having leadership at the top that wasn't the best. But Brittany is a microcosm of, 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 of the 29th Division. Because I'll tell you what, when the men were pulled into Brittany on August 21st, 1944, they had no idea what was about to happen. you got to remember that the rest of the U.S. Army saved the 2nd Division and the 8th Division were proceeding like lightning to the west, heading toward Germany, and uh, the, and the 29th Division was going in exactly the opposite direction. Now that's something that made the men happy. They said, "Okay, we did we did Normandy. Now it's time for all the fresh divisions to engage the enemy on their home turf while we pop up in the rear." It turned out to be anything but. And the Brittany campaign, in terms of pure toe-to-toe. -to -toe, Slugfest combat was among the worst ever experienced by U.S. troops in World War II. So the 29th suffered another 3,000 casualties in a couple of weeks. Wow, 3,000. Well, I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I think we should point out is, you know, obviously Omaha, but then there's that little place called St. Lo that they fight to take, which is, is not exactly an easy... So, uh, well, two questions, really. One... Why are they selected to go to Brittany? I mean, given how important it is to take the port in the overall plan, there doesn't seem to be a lot of preparation for how they're going to do it. And, and also, what condition is the 29th in when they're given this incredibly difficult assignment? Two good questions. Number one, the 29th was in the line uh, until the very, very closing days of Normandy. They were involved in the Falaise pocket. They had had a very vicious fight for the town of Beer, which was comparable to the fight for St. Lo, yet nobody really talks about it that much. Right. So one reason they were ended up being so they ended up being selected for the Brittany campaign was either compassion because they had been so badly beaten up in, in two in two plus months and it was it was in the range of eleven thousand casualties since D did. Jesus. And so, actually just I want to just interject that the division at full strength is what, fourteen, fifteen thousand? Fourteen thousand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. right. So this uh, is essentially a, a different division with the same name. Pretty much. In fact, as I talk about in my book, uh, Beachhead to Brittany, um, it, right outside of Brittany, every battalion that got a rest day was actually interviewed by Army historians about their experience on D-Day, and it turned out that almost no companies had anybody left who was from D-Day. Who could talk about yeah. it. They were very, yeah. very lucky if you found eight or nine men from the 210 man companies who had been on D-Day. That was, a, and this that is, was unusual. This is two months after D-Day. This is yeah. 10 weeks well, after D-Day. Two plus, two plus, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and the second thing, of course, is that um, the 29th Division had the good fortune of just being pulled out of the line exactly as the valet's pocket was closed. So, um, in addition to compassion on the part of Bradley, uh, you know, it made sense. This division had just pulled out of the line. They had a five, four or five day rest, which believe me was not sufficient to really even incorporate any replacements. But right. they said, okay, this is the division that we're sending into Brittany. They, nobody expected what was about to happen. They, nobody knew that 40, 45,000 Germans were going to pocket themselves in Brittany under one of the most fanatical Nazi leaders in all of World War II, Hermann Rocky, who had explicit orders from Hitler to make the, make the Americans pay in lives for every yard of ground gain. So, you know, had the 29ers had foresight, they probably would have said, hey, I prefer going toward Germany. <laughs> right. But nobody, nobody felt that way at the time. So, yeah, but, so there, 
But there was no preparation then for what, how an a yet-to-be-named division or divisions was going to take breast. So the, I guess the plan was we land in Normandy, we get a beachhead, and then we'll just figure it out when we get there? Uh, it, you know, breast is mentioned in Operation Overlord very prominently. As I said, right. it was expected to be in Allied hands by August 1st. We were already behind the times. Cherbourg was the only operational decent-sized port, and, be, and it was becoming woefully inadequate given that two million men were ashore. So, you know, the job of getting breast was just integral. And I can talk later about how controversial yeah. that, that became. And Eisenhower took a lot of heat from it, particularly from Monday morning quarterbacking historians, of, which, of whom I am not one. <laughs> yeah, no, but, nobody like that here. <laughs> I'm looking but, around. I, I, don't, I don't see anybody. But you, but you know who got the job to take breast? It was the person you would least expect. It was Patton. Right. Patton did not want to have his, his focus distracted from what he really wanted to do. And, and yet, he dispatched one of his elite, maybe his most elite division, the 6th Armored Division. He dispatched it in, in August once the breakout happened. He sent it westward and, and said, take rest. And uh, General Grow, the commander, came pretty damn close to doing it because that was the time when it could have been done, when the Germans had not yet gathered everybody in Brittany into the fortress at rest. So... Um, Basically, the thinking was that once Patton had failed to take Brest in a coup de main, Bradley decided that the best thing to do is to approach the uh, Brittany campaign in a, pretty much the same way he approached the Cherbourg campaign. You know, Cherbourg was a pivotal element of, of the early phase of Operation Neptune, or an Overlord, I should say. Three divisions would just pound their way into the city which, although in a very difficult operation, was successfully accomplished relatively quickly. So Bradley, thinking along the same line, said, I'm, I'm sending three divisions. With core assets, it was 55,000, 60,000 men. And he said, there's nothing the Germans can put there that is going to be able to withstand three solid American divisions attacking. And it didn't work out that way. Uh, yeah. that, that's yeah. how that's how they were called into the campaign. And I must say, you know, when the division proceeded into Brittany on the 21st and 22nd of August, it was the most glorious period of the war to date for the men of the division. They had never seen the, the things that uh, uh, Allied soldiers were seeing as they were racing westward. This was the first time that the men were seeing uh, tumultuous crowds waving American flags and throwing flowers on on the vehicles, and uh, it was a it was a, a a very notable event in the minds of the troops, and it was a very nice introduction to Brittany for the men because they became ultimately became very very fond of the Breton people. Hmm. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, so I uh, we we did get a map request, and I want to put a map up here. Uh, this is a map of of Brittany. Um, uh, it sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean uh, quite a ways. So when we it's say the furthest it's, point west, right? The, and Brest, which is basically um, you see the big harbor there on the left, and Brest is the black dot that's surrounded by red lines, which are the German lines uh, for the battle for Brest. Is, is far out. So it is about as far from Paris as you can get in the opposite direction from Germany. And and Joe, you, you allude to this idea. Oh, did, were you still looking at that? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm okay. good. Thank hey, he's you. been there before, I think. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am there now. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm very oh. jealous, right? Yeah. Uh, well, and it's and it's gorgeous country. I can imagine yeah. going through these roads and the excitement of the men and thinking this is a mopping up or operation. Uh, uh, what happens? Um, I mean, obviously the Germans have more men than they they think um, than the Americans realize, and and it's kind of a question is why didn't we realize since we're reading their codes with Enigma. Uh, and um, a fanatical commander and a very, uh, a very difficult terrain. That's something that I was really struck by today. 
driving just around Brest. It's like Normandy on steroids with hedgerows, but it's also got ravines and twisty stuff, and it's it's like tailor made for a a, a a tough defense. Well, can I add into that, Joe? Before you comment, that talk also about these are not stomach battalion German troops that we're going up against here, right? These are again. That's among know the best. That I mean, of course, it's a mix. You know, in the, in the 40,000, 45,000 men the Germans have there, you're going to have your third rate troops. You're going to have their, your, your laborers that don't speak German, your Poles, your, your Czechs, et cetera. But you're also going to have the second parachute division. And I'll tell you that the 29th division, I tell you what, uh, of all of the units in the U.S. Army that fight in the European theater of operations, but at least for the first couple of months, it seems like everywhere the 29th Division had to go and every objective that they had to fulfill, they bounced into German paratroopers. And, um, uh, you know, you hear talk about Panzer troops and SS troops, but there was no better force in the German Army than the Jäger. They were better armed, they were better motivated. And indeed, you know, the leader, the very leader of the troops, German troops in Brest, was himself a Fallschirmjäger, Hermann uh, Ramke. He was, he was one of the icons of the German parachute force. Um, and uh, inter he was in intimately involved in the uh, famous Creed operation. Um, anyway, Chris, it would, you're exactly right. They, they, you know, you did, you, the last people you want to fight against in stagnant warfare in in Bocage country, very, very similar to Normandy, were German paratroopers. Mm -hmm. But to add to what Rick said, in addition to the horrible uh, terrain, which grossly favored the defender, uh, you also added to the equation, unlike Normandy permanent fortifications of a very, very formidable nature that the Americans had never seen before, ranging from 17th century fortifications that the Germans had modernized to, uh, there's Fort Montbarry, there's the main gate. Is that not the main gate, Rick? Yeah, it is. Yeah, you know what? Literally, literally an American 105 millimeter cannon from the 116th Infantry was 20 yards away from that gate pounding it with direct fire on September 16, 1944, and British tanks, um, crocodiles from the 141st Regiment of the Royal Armored Corps were uh, running around that fort, uh, spraying uh, flamethrower uh, gels and uh, igniting the walls of the fort. It was one of the most horrific scenes of combat in all of World War II, but hopefully we'll get to that later. But Anyway, the, the point being that uh, that type of fortification was added to the terrain equation, making it uh, an utter hell for the combat soldier. It, it, was, it, was, it was a campaign that had no subtlety whatsoever from the leadership on top. It was just, no, there was no choice but for the common infantrymen to push forward another field every day until you ultimately were fighting in the streets of Brest. And uh, as I said, it cost the 29th Division 3,000 men. It cost the rest of the 8th Corps 7,000 men. And um, it, was, it was among the toughest fighting uh, that U.S. troops could ever experience in Europe in World War II. So, so Joe, could you maybe touch a little bit about, you know, you get into to Rompe, and aside from him being somebody I wouldn't invite to my Christmas party, um, he seems to be a very efficient commander, and he's kind of has overall command of everything. So I, I think in a lot of respects, maybe his situation might be easier in a command perspective. But you talk about some, I don't know if dissension is the right word, or disorganization amongst the American commanders. Could you kind of like walk us through who some of these people are? I know you've got Middleton and then, you know, the sure. divisional commanders. Well, number one, you're looking at a picture of the surrender on September 19, 1944, of Ramke, with his famous Irish setter dog. Uh, General Stroh is on the right, but the person looking right into the camera is a uh, general, former colonel of the 116th Infantry, who landed in the first wave on Omaha Beach and gained a distinguished service cross on Omaha Beach, Charles Cannon. 
Yeah. He's the one who took the surrender directly from Romke. Uh, in a very, very notable quote that maybe some of your listeners have heard, you know, Romke was an obnoxious son of a bitch. Even, he, even fellow German generals hated him. Uh, you know, one of the most fascinating sources I had for my Beachhead to Brittany book were secret re- transcripts of secret recordings that the British had made in the prison camps for general German general officers yep. in, in England. My God, to read what those people were saying about Romney, they hated him. I mean, number yeah. one, he was he was an officious, uh, ardent, ardent Nazi, and um, General von Toma, who was uh, uh, Rommel's second in command in the Africa Africa War, famously said, "Romney." Uh, of all the generals in the German army, he knows best how to look out for number one, he said. <laughs> and part of that was criticism because Romke actually tried to escape, uh, you know, the surrender. He did not want to be taken prisoner. He did everything in his power to have a plane sent to get him out of there. And mm-hmm. the Germans really, the fellow gen- German generals did not like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, to get back to the canon quote, R- Romke being an obnoxious bastard, can I say that on Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, he's, he didn't want to accept the surrender from Charles Cannon because Cannon was a single one star general and, and Romke was the equivalent, I believe, maybe of a three star, but perhaps two. Anyway, he looked at Cannon very derisively and he said, you know, where are your credentials? <laughs> and Canham being Canham being an absolute German hater, he had his guys with Thompson submachine guns behind him, holding them rather aggressively, and he pointed at these men and he said, "Here are my credentials." <laughs> and um, that motto actually became the motto of the U.S. Army in the mid nine mid to late nineties. Soldiers are our credentials, and that's how that Canham thought that up. But to get to your question about the American leadership, number one, the problem was Patton was in charge. Wait, wait, I just want to be clear. So so Patton screwed up? He screwed up in the sense that he paid no attention to what was going on in Brittany. Yeah, am am I allowed to say that? Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, oh, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, He screwed up in the sense that that Brest was a sideshow. And so much so to give you a, you know, a... A very trivial uh, example of how stupid it was when the 29th Division arrived at Brest to undertake this what turned out to be monumental battle they had no maps they had to send their G2 and S2 that is their intelligence officers to Patton's headquarters to get maps of Brest the problem was Patton's headquarters was already 300 miles away so literally 29th Division intelligence officers were making 600 mile round trips in jeeps to get the maps they needed to fight the battle uh and believe me american soldiers need maps to carry out the war they, they're helpful the best of their they're helpful you know oh, <laughs> they're very they're helpful. helpful so anyway bottom line was that ike and bradley understood that Patton was not the guy to lead this show and they brought uh a new man over from England. They they had an army headquarters in England waiting to be inserted into the front once the front stabilized in Germany, but they brought him in early, and that was William Simpson, Lieutenant General William Simpson, commanding general of the 9th Army, who was, you know, in my opinion, probably one of the finest army commanders in the American army in all of World War II. And one of the reasons is you never, you never hear of him because he was just a total professional. He worked beautifully with his allies. He worked beautifully with the British, particularly Monty, because he often was under Monty's command. Right. Can, but, can I mention here, Chris, that William Simpson was a big fan of the Ghost Army and oh, wrote them a letter the, the of recommendation? Who are they? What? I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised. He was, and he maybe was, it starts with with yeah with here. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure it started there. But Simpson was brought in, I believe, on August 31st, maybe September 1st, to take charge. But you know, essentially, that was just to relieve Patton of the burden. But the, the man really running the show in Brittany was uh, Troy Middleton, 
the former commander of the 45th Infantry Division, another beloved general. You don't really find many of these generals that the, soul, the dog-faced soldiers really adore. And Middleton was one of those, as was proven by the fact that one of the most famous 45th Division soldiers of all time, Bill Malden, the, yeah. the cartoonist, he loved Middleton. And believe me, Bill Malden hated, for the most part, U.S. Army generals with all right. their chicken shit. Am I allowed to say that? Well, yes, you are. <laughs> you, have, you have a pass. It, <laughs> Bill Malden despised we, 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 Pat, as you know. We, we've heard Chris Wallace on this show saying worse words than you're saying now. Oh, so well, it's okay. Then, okay, I'm in good company. Then. You have, you have <laughs> a hill to climb, Joe. <laughs> uh, Troy Milton was a beloved soldier. He was a he was this he was this friend to the infantrymen. He had a he had a statement that people like Patton and Gerhardt would have just their blood would have run cold. He once was asked to join the cavalry, Roy Middleton, and he said, "I don't like horses." Ooh. And you know that you know in the interwar U.S. Army that yeah. was that was you know that was like saying, "Well, I, I don't want to yeah. get into that." But but anyway, Middleton. Um, he, he was the youngest regimental commander in World in World War One in the U.S. Army. Later went on to become uh, Chancellor or President of LSU, and he was uh, he was a, a marvelous, marvelous leader. He had the misfortune of commanding the corps that held the Ardennes when the Germans struck in the Battle of Bull. Yeah. But but he had a he had you know he had the toughest job here at Brest because with fifty thousand men. He was attacking forty thousand men right. in, in in formidable entrenchments. Well, yeah, and, and I, you know, man, those are not good odds. I was going to say, I mean, just about any military manual says if you're going to attack a defended position, you need three to one odds. You need at least three to one at odds. One, right. They're fortified even more than that. Right, and so the 29th yeah. and the eighth corps going almost one to one, less than one, Pretty one much. to one. Yeah. Well, oh, I mean. Wow. You know, and, 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 and the pressure was on Middleton because the, the, the logistical clock was ticking. You know, the, the Monday morning quarterbacks could say, well, you just could have starved Gronke out. You know, just you know, bombard him and wait till he runs out of food. You know, that that was not going to work. And, and they were and they were bombarding. There was tremendous constant. Air Force bombardment of, of Brest. I mean, Some they, they of the were more... In fact, that Patton was quite ticked off that a, a huge amount of tactical air power was diverted from the, you know, the western frontier of Germany for Brittany. It turned out that they committed gigantic amounts of air power to try to take Brest as quickly as possible. So Middleton was the guy running the show. But of course, I can't go. I can't go on without talking about General Charles Gerhardt. He was the commander of the 29th Division. He was the absolute antithesis of Middleton. He was a, he was a cavalryman uh, to his core, and he was a highly highly aggressive soldier. That uh, you know, depending on your judgment, you either loved him or you hated him. And since I've been studying him for thirty years, I, I have to say this, you know, with, without any opinion one way or the other. But many more people hated him than loved him. Then and uh, and and the problem was that you know he couldn't really exert leadership on this press campaign because it was nothing more than straight ahead frontal attack day after day after day. But he was a, he had the personality that made the life of his lives of his subordinates hell because if he took one field, it had to be two. If he took two, it had to be three. And oh, uh, you I know now. That. Some might argue that that's the type of leader you needed in World War II, and maybe you need it in this condition of trying to seize breath as soon as possible. I'll, I'll make no judgments on that. But uh, and what happened to him after Brest is another story. I read my book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. We, we, we have to get you up to ten appearances per the challenge <laughs> okay. laid down at the beginning. Well, there are only five books in the series, but you know we'll we'll get there. We'll get there, Joe. I could write another five. I, I hope. But, you know, I hope so. You know, let's go. If you'll let's pardon go. that pun, let's go. Um, the motto of the 29th. So um, uh, uh, we we showed this picture very briefly before. I visited here this morning Fort Fort Montbury. Um, 
<clears throat> which is just outside of Brest, which is, this is just a tiny part of it, of course, which was actually built during the American Revolution. Okay, it's been around a while. Uh, I think Vauban, the famous designer who designed every fort in that period, uh, designed it. It's surrounded by oh. an amazing moat uh, uh, that looks something like uh, this. You know, it doesn't have water in it, but it is a big, you know, going down and, and coming up. Um, and it was apparently um, <clears throat> a real uh, uh, tenacious uh, a titanic, really, struggle. I think that's the phrase that you used, Joe, uh, to, to here between the 116th and uh, some of the, the paratroopers. And it also involved, I think, some uh, British with the, uh, with the uh, uh, tanks fitted with, uh, with uh, uh, flamethrowers. A really incredible battle that takes place there. Uh, yes. September 14th to September 16th, 1944, may have been the toughest combat that the 29th Division, or I should say a small part of the 29th Division, ever, ever fought in World War II. Number one, it was as close to World War I combat as any American Army unit ever experienced in the Second World War. Um, it was a moonscape of craters and uh, barbed wire and buried shells and uh, uh, concrete fortifications, dugouts, uh, flares going up at night. It was, you know, you would have been a, a soldier from the Meuse Oregon offensive would have been would have recognized this easily. It was one battalion of the 116th Infantry, circa 800 men fighting against one parish Bolshevik Jaeger company that was defending Fort Montbert. And, Fort, and, the, and, the, and the young lieutenant, Bolshevik Jaeger lieutenant defending the fort, had orders to just fight to the death. It was almost like a, a Tarawa operation where you, they were going to fight until the last man went down. But it was it was it was combat of such extraordinary intensity that I try to get it over in my book. It involved, as you say, fifteen crocodile tanks spraying uh, uh, flamethrower uh, jets. Again, there's there's a crocodile right there with the famous carrier of the of the fuel right behind it. Um, it, in, it can you show me the picture of the mode again? But yeah, the, moat, I, I, the, the, the moat is sacred, sacred ground to 29th Division soldiers because of what happened in that moat. I'm, uh, here, here it is. Go ahead. Yes. The moat that surrounded that fort is ultimately how the men of the 29th Division made it into the fort. It, it, after three days of solid fighting, and, and uh, Major Tom Dallas, commanding the 1st Battalion of the 116th Infantry, repeatedly sending in message to, the, to Lieutenant Floater of the, of the Falschenjäger to surrender, pounding him mercilessly and getting responses back from the Germans saying, is that all you've got? We can take more than that. And then uh, Dallas saying, okay, I'm going to blow you to hell, but he didn't use he didn't use that those phrases exactly, and I don't want to say the words yet. So, <laughs> you but, haven't gotten um, that far up the hill yet. <laughs> I don't want to get that bad, <laughs> but I do know what he said. And Mr. It is Happy Hour book. after hours. <laughs> <laughs> after hours. So anyway, I have written about the 29th Division for 30 years, and it I still get chills when I think of some of the episodes of what happened at Fort Montbarry, the, the just out and out heroism that was exhibited by common soldiers, British and American alike, to overcome these fanatical defenders, it's, it's just, it defies belief. Mm. It, um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, in the first three, the first three British crocodile tanks to try to go through the minefield, um, to get at the fort. One of them blew up on a, on a, on a, I believe it was a very 12 inch German naval shell. shell. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, you know, and believe me, a 12 inch naval shell is a big piece of oil. <laughs> and when it blows up under a tank, it's going to be pretty nasty. It would have been an event that clearly would have, you know, indicated to the follow on tanks that I better not go ahead. Right. Not only did they not go ahead, 
there was a there was a there was a crocodile tank led by a young British lieutenant named Tony Ward that went ahead. Not only did he go ahead, he went around the entire fort, used up something like 180 uh, squirts of its flamethrower material until it was all gone. Used up its entire 75 millimeter main gun ammunition. Uh, as it was going around the fort, it tipped into a shell crater and, and became non-functional. The entire tank crew came out of the tank with Bren guns and pistols and ended up taking something like 60 German prisoners. Wow. Um, it just and, and, and one of the first times in the history, well, and obviously not the first time, I'm not an expert in this matter, but Tony Ward was awarded a U.S. Army Silver Star, which was an extremely unusual event for a member of the foreign army to get a silver star. And frankly, when you read when you read of his heroism, he deserved the Medal of Honor. Yeah. The 29th Division was very, very stingy with its decorations. But what happened next is even more amazing. The, tw the 29th Division infantrymen figured out that the way into the fort was actually through a stone tunnel that led under the walls of the fort, probably right near that picture of the moat. And um, under fire from Germans in the fort, engineers from the 29th Division, led by a remarkable, remarkable uh, U.S. engineer named Sergeant Ned Humphrey, who interestingly enough was British, uh, and he had, he had just moved to Utah, Salt Lake City, right before World War II. Uh, and he was he was of all things he was a he was a uh, he was a kind of an aristocrat. He was a fox hunter and a dog breeder and a falconer. And here he was as a sergeant in the 121st Engineer Combat Battalion, <laughs> taking dozens of crates, 60 pound crates of TNT, under fire and bringing them under into that moat that you just showed us and putting them right near the tunnel that led under the walls of the fort. Um, he was given a silver star for this uh, act, and he only lived three more weeks. Mm. Uh, but what happened was that Dallas, the American commander, said to the Germans one more time, if you don't give up, I'm going to blow you to hell. No response. They were ready to go when a messenger came to Major Dallas in his command post saying that, I hate to say this, sir, but there's a, there's a, there's a, one of our soldiers is dead in the moat. His name is Lieutenant Settles, and uh, Dallas knew Settles. They had both been in the Virginia National Guard together as enlisted men, and they were both from the same town in Virginia, and Settles was dead. His corpse was lying right near the point at which the uh, you know, something like 2,000 pounds of TNT was about to be detonated, and Dallas would not do it. He would not detonate the TNT unless somebody volunteered to go in and bring out settled body under fire into that moat. You can see in that moat that it's 10 feet away from the wall. Amazingly, a man from regimental headquarters named Frank Kelton, Lieutenant Frank Kelton, went into that moat he picked, he found Settle's body, he picked up Settle's body, and he personally carried it out into American lines. He reported to Dallas and said, I have recovered Lieutenant Settle's body. And Dallas looked at the, whoever it was who was going to push the plunger, and he said, blow them to hell. And he did. And, if, and Rick, if you were in Fort Montbury, and you looked very carefully, the entire north wall of the fort doesn't exist anymore. Right. And that's right. where that detonation happened, and, uh, and 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 you know the Germans went down fighting, but uh, and believe me, as I ta as I talk about in my book, those who survived, the Americans were in no mood to be kind to them. Right. You know, and war crimes were not committed; they did not shoot the prisoners, but they certainly Dallas himself, according to witnesses, had a had a senior NC German NCO come up to him and. Uh, he said to Dallas, he said, I am, no, it was an officer. I think it might have been Floater. He said, I'm a German officer. I expect to be treated with the considerations of war. And Dallas pulled out his pistol and said, you're a prisoner of war. Put up your hands. 
<laughs> and another German NCO came in, and he, you know, he, he actually used that phrase, that term that Americans were always referred to by Germans, particularly by Nazis. They always called American soldiers gangsters. That was the favorite term of Germans yeah. to refer to American soldiers. And he called his interrogator a gangster. And this this twenty nine er just let him have it, right in the face with a with a roundhouse punch, <laughs> and uh, and you know they stole everything off of him. They took their watches, they took their their wallets, you know. And believe me, they were probably very jealous that these guys were going to end up in a prisoner of war camp in the United States. And 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 you know yeah. the, you know the twenty nine ers were not sure they were going to see another sunrise. But that's the story of Fort Mountberry, and and way more than that. Uh, yeah. You know, when I when I visited it, it was chilling to me. When you look at how small that thing is, and you realize how men got right up to the enemy, mano a mano, yeah. and 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 both British and American. And and I also want to say one of the probably the finest example in all of World War II of cooperation between the British and American Army. It was seamless. Dallas called the, man, the commander of that squadron of British tanks the finest soldier he ever knew. You know, that's the type of, that's how you win wars, you know? Yeah. And and to have people that were able to cooperate like that to get this job done, it just was a very, very impressive story to me. So, yeah. And they, it's a, an impressive place. And they have, um, you know, they have a lot of vehicles, American vehicles, They no German vehicles there. <laughs> And uh, uh, they have the wing of a of a bomber that was shot down, and they have a they know what bomber it was and who the crew was, and they have a ceremony every year where the nephew of of one of the crewmen comes back because the, most of the crewmen didn't survive, and uh, and they take it very seriously. And I, I I had gone there. It's a Sunday, and and I I, I got there at five after two. They opened at two o'clock today, and I paid my money and and. Uh, and and went in and not five minutes later i because clearly i was an american i don't pass for a frenchman in any way shape or form um uh th they somehow had managed to summon the executive director uh who who showed up and she wanted to know if i could would, would i be here on thursday could i come to the ceremony that they're having to honor this american uh bomber crew no, I said I couldn't, but I hope to bring some people back next year. She wanted to start talking about the, the party that she, she wants to throw for the Americans coming back. And, you know, in, in all the world, um, we hear, you know, France and the U.S. are kind of fighting right now. And sometimes people are like, oh, the French don't remember kind of what we did. You know, there's a lot of places in France and in Europe where they do remember. And they remember Absolutely. kind of their, their Americans, right? The Americans who, who you know, it might be one guy who died at a crossroads, or it might be a bomber crew, or it might be, you know, somebody else. But it's their Americans, who, and they're very, very proud of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I when I was in Fort Montbury when some of those 29th Division soldiers were still young enough to be mm, very wow. mobile and had very sharp memories, and I stood on the the, re the wreckage of that North Wall with the man who actually ran into that fort after the detonation. And uh, I think on that trip there were probably 50, 50 to 60 World War II 29ers, and my God, the way they were treated by the Bretons was just. I still even can't believe it when I think of it, how they were, they were treated like gods. And, um, well, and especially when you think about, I mean, Brittany and Brest in particular, it was not treated kindly by the Air Force, right? I mean, it's not, right. in the fighting, the, the Bretons gave up a lot, right? That, that You cannot yeah. believe what they gave up. I mean, you know, I, th this type of thing cannot be quantified, but people have said that Brest was, uh, you know, and top three of cities destroyed in, in Europe in World War II. Stalingrad, Brest, uh, you know, not many others. Cologne, maybe. Uh, but, you know, Brest was a mere shell when it was done. And much of it was from US, uh, U.S. and British air power. So, but, you know, that's the thing that is astonishing to me. The same thing with St. Lo. You know, the recognition by the Norman people and the Breton people that this was all part of the liberation and accepting it. You know, that's 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 kind of chilling. <laughs> and, 
and very gratifying. Uh, and, but you know, Brittany, Brittany is it's one of my. It's probably my favorite place in the whole world. It's as you just learned, Rick. It's it's stunningly beautiful. It has places like the, the West Coast, in Monterey, in California, yeah, Point Saint Matthew, the Lighthouse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it's, and you know the language, the, you know the the, the Breton language, the bagpipes, the, Reser, Mag, the bagpipes, the, bagpipes. It's, uh, the uniqueness. Yeah, and, you know, and and when you read about what happened there in World War II, you know that one of the most robust areas of French resistance was Brittany, of course. Yeah. You know, and I mentioned, I mentioned, I talked a lot about Ronke earlier. You know, Ronke was very, very lucky to have survived the French resistance attack. On the way to getting into press, when killed one of his aides, right? It, literally sitting two feet away from him in the back seat of the car, okay. it killed his chief of staff. And believe me, Romke retaliated big time. I mean, you know, the the the, the wielding of Nazi power in Western Brittany was not very pretty. And the resistance was consequently very fierce. <clears throat> so much so that, you know, the, the resistance fighters joined eagerly with the 29th Division once the dress campaign began. So, so, so Joe, we're, um, as always, getting close to our hour. And I didn't, I want to make sure that we leave some time to talk about kind of the controversy of breast. I know we've talked about, you know, Monday morning historians um and you go into some great detail in your book about this issue but you know as people will discover when they read the book breast is taken at, at incredible cost um but the war's moved on they're still fighting in breast when operation market garden goes in so you know the supplies don't come into breast should should the the channel ports have been skipped did Eisenhower make the wrong call? What do you think? Eisenhower made the decision that had to be made at the time. As I try to get over in my book, the very, very vigorous criticism about this decision about breast being taken with 10,000 casualties and then ultimately never being repaired and used uh, is mostly wielded against Eisenhower post-war by historians, and it continued today. Right. Uh, some of the great American historians, Carlo Deste, if you knew him, or uh, right. Russell Wiley, both of whom were brilliant, brilliant men, and, and I have to say friends of mine. Uh, they, I believe, they, they're no longer living, but I, I believe they fell into that trap. Uh, Carlo Deste famously said in one of his books that uh, the Brittany campaign was a huge military embarrassment to the Allies. Russell Wigley, one of the greatest historians of the U.S. Army in our, ever, you know, said that uh, Eisenhower was uh, unwise to be a slave to the overboard plan. But this is why I write my books, you know. I, 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 I write a book about a meticulous day-to-day description about what a division was doing every day in combat in World War II. But part of the, you know, what I have to do to get that over is I have to give not only the picture of the riflemen, I have to give the grand picture of the, of the grand poobahs and what they're doing too, or else it means nothing to the reader about what these soldiers are doing. And when you go day to day in examining what was going on in the European theater while the 29th Division was fighting at Brest, it was very obvious that it made enormous sense for uh, Eisenhower to uh, make every effort to get that port open as soon as possible. Look, look, at, look at the whole history of when the ports were open. Le Havre did not open until, it did not get liberated until September 12th, was not open until mid-October. Antwerp was liberated on the 4th of September, but as you well know, was not operational until, operational right. until November 23rd. Calais and Boulogne and, and Dunkirk, one of those never gave up the whole war. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it was very obvious that Brest had to be taken if this logistical thing 
was going to work. Right. And it, it's a very, you, you read the last chapter of my book, it's a complex subject, but the bottom line is the Germans got in the way. What was supposed to have been done by August 1st did not get done until September 18th. And by September 18th, everything had changed. Even after September 18th, they didn't give up on Brest until September 30th. And by that time, Marseille was beginning to get into operation. But bottom line is, had the Americans been more, uh, had, had they been able to seize Brest according to the parameters of the plan, that is, it could have been opened by August 10th or August 15th. Right. And it just, you know, Romke got in the way. And, uh, and of course, being the good Nazi that he was, he did everything in his power to booby trap every single yeah. thing in that city. The 29th Division soldiers were killed when they moved a bicycle or they picked up a pistol, you know. And, and Romke famously said in captivity that he, if he had had chemicals, he didn't, yeah, fortunately. He, he would have put uh, gas all over the city to prevent you know, anybody from repairing anything. Yeah. So anyway, in, in summary, for complex reasons, I believe it is very off base to criticize Eisenhower for that decision. He made the exact decision that any general of any, uh, any adeptness would have made in exactly his shoes. And I, you know, never before had I seen so clearly what a definition of Monday morning quarterbacking can be. It's very easy to make a judgment 10 years after the fact when you see the press was never used. Right. Not, not as easy to make it when you're sitting in Eisenhower's headquarters and you're saying, huh, I got to have, you know, a hundred, you know, a million tons of supplies in, in, a, in two weeks and I don't have any ports. <laughs> you know? So up. anyway. Well, you know, this is a, a Sunday night show, so no Monday morning quarterback <laughs> is allowed. Uh, Joe Balkowski, there's so much we didn't get to, including the great role that the Rangers play uh, in, in, in helping to take the Graf Spee battery. And uh, all I can say is come on the Ghost Army tour next year. We visit the battery and we'll, we'll tell that story. And maybe we can have you back, Joe, uh, sometime before, as we deal with the next book, maybe we can still spend a little time on Brittany and tell some of those stories and then go to the next book. Well, I, in my third book, and actually the first two chapters are about Brittany and getting ready to move to Holland. So, awesome. uh, and, and that's when you get all the off-color stories that I, you oh, know, that I yeah. Yeah. Oh, Happy story. Hour loves the off-color uh, stories. You gotta get to me. And by the way, I, I meant to tell you, I I love Brittany so much that I, I when my daughter was one year old and I went to press, I bought her a, a Breton doll which, uh, you know, this is the traditional Breton costume, and uh, this was a, a present for her when she was one year old, and this is uh, one of my favorite uh, souvenirs of Brittany. So. Oh, fantastic. So, everybody, you have to make sure that you read this book of Joe's before the next show, so you're ready for... And, and not only, by the way, not only is it good history, it's very readable. Joe's, uh, Joe's, Joe's, Joe's hits on both of those important bullets, both uh, something that's very well researched and uh, something that is, you, you, every page, there's amazing stuff on it. And this book is called Beachhead to Brittany, the 29th Infantry Division at Brest, August to September 1944. It doesn't mention the Ghost Army, but aside from that, most But new edition, a new edition will. New edition may be coming oh, right. out sometime of course. in the next century. By next so. week, yeah. <laughs> Joe, if you can hang out a second, hang on. We'll chat with you off the air. But uh, thank you so much for having uh, for being here with us today. You're Thanks, welcome. Joe. Okay, Thanks. all right. All right, thank you. And, and Chris, because I haven't mentioned the Ghost Army quite enough. <laughs> ghost Army, Ghost Army, Ghost Army, Ghost Army. In today's show. And, I, and actually, I just want to say that this is this is a mention that you said I should do. I know, do. I, did. I did. You that. did say that I should do this. We want to give a shout out to someone who has been a guest on this show, along with right. Joe Belkowski, although he's only been on it once so far. And that's 14-year-old uh, Caleb Sinwell. And Caleb was presented with an award from the United States Army Special Forces, presented by uh, Major uh, Ashley Holtzman from the PSYOPs Brigade. And he uh, it was for the website that 
uh, uh, Caleb created the National History Day website that he created for the Ghost Army and uh, for his lobbying uh, efforts that he's been involved in on behalf of uh, awarding the Ghost Army a uh, Congressional Gold Medal. And um, I have, if I, if I can push the buttons correctly, Chris, and that is always a challenge, as you know for me, uh, I think we can put the uh, website up there in the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, comments. And on the right, you see Senator uh, Chuck Grassley from Iowa came to the assembly. He came to Caleb's school assembly uh, where he was given this award. And Senator Grassley told uh, Caleb Sinwell and also repeated on his uh, Instagram feed that he was going to help corral some of the rest of the co-sponsors we need for that legislation to pass because we need 11 more senators for that legislation to pass and I I know Chuck Grassley is a is a one of the Senate's he's the Senate's oldest uh, longest serving senator and one of the great history nerds in the Senate uh, so uh, I think he's a person of his word and uh, so we're hoping for some help there so it was an incredible Ghost Army week, and this was an incredible show you. talking about the fighting that took place in, uh, in Brittany from the 29th, and two other divisions, and the Rangers, and the British, and the Air Force, who were all uh, part of making that happen. And so uh, next week, um, we got nothing. We're taking the week <laughs> off. We're, we, are, we are taking the week off. Come back in two weeks. Next week, go back to one of those previous 78 shows and check it out. They're all really good. Well, okay. Yes. We're gonna catch up our reading. We have to good. restock. We have to restock the bar. Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for another history happy hour. We so appreciate it. We do. Be safe, everyone. See you in a couple weeks.